lifting. This is the uh, September 2021 um, edition of the uh, Mount Vernon Clinic of the Fourth Division PNR and MRA. So here we go. So when I was a kid, cartoons on TV were with engineer Bill Stulla. And uh, people tell me, I think it was Brakeman Bob in this part of the world. But since I already was interested in trains, this helped me along the way. Here is a picture of my sister and I at one of uh, Engineer Bill's public appearances. And so uh, Cartoon TV9 Express, you can see that here on the drumhead sign, uh, sponsored a excursion from LA Union Passenger Terminal to Duarte, California, which is where City of Hope is. So here is my sister and I. Here we are in front of the F unit that pulled the train. And here I am inside the F unit. Obviously, this impressed me quite a bit. In fact, knowing what it's like to climb into an F unit, I'm trying to imagine what it was like to climb into an F unit at that age. Well, one of the things that Engineer Bill gave me when my sister and I were on his TV show was a series of cartoon books. I think one was about Casey Jones, one was about trains in general. And in the center spread of this cartoon book was this F unit cab. You see, you could tape on the brake handle, you could tape on the throttle handle and uh, pretend that you were driving your F unit. Here's the back side of that graham cracker box from the 1950s. So when the family were riding in the car, I'd be driving my F unit. So my favorite railroad when I was growing up and my first HO scale layout was Santa Fe theme. And of course, Santa Fe loved F units. They had some E units, but uh, most of their passenger trains were pulled by F units. So when my interest changed to the Kansas City Southern Railroad, they also had a large fleet of F units in their handsome uh, red, yellow, and dark green paint scheme. And of interest was their freight units were painted exactly the same as their passenger units, except the red and yellow colors were reversed. I don't know of another railroad that did that. So way on the other end of my life, when I moved up to the Northwest, Cedro Woolley, to uh, practice medicine, one of the last stands for F units uh, was this Sumas line, which ran right through Cedro Woolley. In fact, there was an article in Trains Magazine about a gentleman who got a ride on the F units. And I met that engineer in Burlington and I got a ride from Burlington to Cedra Woolley on the F units of the Sumas train. So the start of this bizarre project was a friend in Florida by the name of Seth Bramson who sold rail artifacts and asked me if I would be interested in a Kansas City Southern NW2 throttle stand. So never having collected anything like this before, I said yes. And so it arrived on a wooden pallet. And here's what it looked like when it came to me. And so here it is completely disassembled in the garage and painted and cleaned. And here it is in a layout that I had in the garage. Uh, and it was actually hooked up to the layout. I put a gear quadrant inside the throttle part of the stand and a rheostat so that I could control the trains on the Mala Railroad from this NW2 throttle stand. Well, one day he called me and he said, I have someone who has the throttle stand out of Kansas City Southern E unit number 21. By then I had learned the difference between a switcher throttle stand and a road unit throttle stand. The switcher throttle stand is like the accelerator on your car. It, it doesn't have any notches. You can push it all the way down or let it all the way up. But road units have a eight notch throttle, which allows you to come up, bring power up on all the units without overloading any of the units because it has to be done in eight incremental steps. 
So I was looking for a road unit throttle. However, what I knew and Seth Bramson didn't know is KCS 21 used to be number one. And number one was the 822 demonstrator for the E3s. Kansas City Southern liked the demonstration run on their railroad so much they bought the demonstrator. So this throttle would have actually been the throttle out of the original EMD E3 demonstrator. However, I sent him the $300, but the guy never sent the throttle. And Seth Bramson was nice enough to credit me $300 in uh, merchandise, but I never got the road unit throttle. So my good friend Warner, who's online now, I went with him to a, a GN Historical Society convention when it was in Seattle. And they took us in a tour of uh, Inner Bay Roundhouse. And in the Inner Bay Roundhouse were all of these switchers with caps on their stacks. And I asked him where they were headed. And he said, oh, there's a, they're sending them all to Simon Scrap. There's a recession on, and when the recession's off, we're going to need them. But anyway, that's where they're going. So I asked him where Simon Scrap were, and they're located in Tacoma, Washington. So still looking for a road unit throttle, I contacted Simon Scrap Metal and told them that I wanted a throttle stand, a brake stand, dash, a seat. And he said, oh, yeah, we got all those. We'll sell you that, or we'll sell you a a whole locomotive. <laughs> so I got acquainted with the 462D, uh, which became the 682 on the BN. This was the last, excuse me, go back here. Uh, let's see. Oh, well. Page down, page back. There we go. This was the last time GN purchased four unit sets. They purchased four, four unit sets. And they were uh, assigned to freight, they were geared for freight service, so they only had one headlight. And so when I went to the scrapyard, the first th thing I encountered was Mr. Simon, who said, who are you with? And I said, I represent myself. And I, he said, what do you want? I said, I want a throttle stand. That's $1,000. I want a brake stand. That's $500. So I was uncertain as to quite what to do. But in the meantime, Mr. Simon left and I went out in the scrapyard and looked. They had a pile of throttle stands 15 feet high, a pile of brake stands 15 feet high. So with Mr. Simon gone, I talked to Mr. Cahill, who was a little more sympathetic. And he said, well, what are you trying to do? Mock up the cab of an F unit? And I said, yes. He said, well, I'll sell you the cab off the 682 for the same prices that I've just quoted you, which was $50 for the brake stand, $50 for the throttle stand, $25 for the dash, $25 for the seat. So I said, well, I think we can do business. He said, plus $35 an hour for the torch cutting, because they couldn't just blow it apart, which is what they would normally do. They had to use a fine, a fine nozzle and cut carefully. So I said, well, here's a can of yellow paint. You show me where you want it cut. And as opposed to Warner's F unit, which was outdoors and made it a little easier, having to fit this in the basement, I had 18 inches cut off the bottom of the F unit. Even at that, to clear the F unit and the horns, the basement has a nine and a half foot ceiling. And one nice thing is you can uh, step into it without having to climb a ladder. So I had it cut into three parts. I had the nose cut off and I had the cab cut in half. And the reason for that was to be able to carry it on a U-Haul trailer that I could rent for $15 a day because I didn't know how much a commercial trucker would charge for an overwith load from Tacoma to Cedar Woolley and I didn't want to find out. So here's what the cab interior looked like. It was filthy. Brake gauge is missing. Warning light missing. Top of the throttle stand was missing. But Mr. Cahill said, you know, you're paying good money for this. So whatever's missing, we'll replace. 
So it was going to end up here in the backyard behind the house. And here after torch cutting is lifting the engineer side of the locomotive. And I built a uh, wooden base for this to sit on that had very heavy duty casters under it. Um, the idea is that I would be able to roll it off the trailer when I got it home. So here's a picture in the rear view mirror, bringing it home. Here it is in front of our house. <laughs> I was new at this, so you think I have enough chains. I didn't want it to move. But when I got it home and tried to figure out how to roll it off the trailer onto the cement slab, I kind of got weak knees. So I quickly called my friend in Cedro Woolley, Ken Rowland, who owned uh, Truss Engineering, and he came out with his truss crane and picked it off the, uh, off the wooden base I'd made for it and set it in the backyard. I said, man, Ken, I got to pay you something for this. He says, man, those wheels under that look great. We need them in our shop. So here's picking up the fireman's side. And here is my beloved wife in the midst of the scrapyard taking pictures for me. That is an amazing girl. Here's the fireman's side. Here, when I talk about a pile 15 feet high, that's what I'm talking about. So now here it is on the trailer, ready to go north. Of course, this part of it hasn't seen the light of day for many years. Exiting Cook Road, arriving at the house. And here is loading the nose section. Setting it down on the trailer. Now you notice I have this little thing here that says hot tub. When we... <laughs> When we stopped uh, a little bit northbound on the freeway to get something cold to drink, someone saw that and said, is that a hot tub? <laughs> I don't know how they imagined it looked like a hot tub. But when we pulled off in Everett at Dairy Queen to get something to eat, a young lady came in and said, what are you doing with the nose off of an F unit? And I said, how in the world did you know that? He said, oh, my husband and I were stationed in Germany and we both were in the model railroading. So one person thought it was a hot tub. The other person recognized it was the nose off an F unit, even though it was upside down. So here are the three pieces in the backyard, roughly in position. And the backside, just cleaning it and painting it was not an option. There's what the fireman's side looked like. The, oh, I got to tell you this part of the story. It has a steam generator control panel, which as you can see is in terrible shape. Why would a freight unit have a steam generator control panel? The answer is they wanted to use these locomotives as if needed in substitute for passenger service so that even though this locomotive did not have a steam generator. It had the panel to control other locomotives that did have steam generators. Here's the front of the cab here. After I took this equipment out, there were three shovelfuls of dirt and debris in that area. I had an a engineer visit me who said, you know, I was an engineer on your locomotive. And he said, I'll tell you one thing about F units. They were beautiful. But dirt got in and it never got out. So here's the back wall. And this is all going to have to be sandblasted. So all this lettering is going to have to be replaced. Here's a close up of the steam generator panel. The three push buttons are missing, one of the indicator lights is missing. This gauge, you can see what it looks like. There's no hand, no glass. Next thing was to take out the uh, plywood floors, which were inch and a half plywood. They were greasy, dirty, and they had been used so much that the 
floor had been worn down through the tile and through the upper layers of the plywood. So I cut them up and burned them. However, found out that they were fireproof. You could burn them, but they would only, only burn by glowing and slowly wearing away. Here's the engineer's floor out. So I had to make friends with my welder, welding here, filling holes here, filling holes there. This was bent out during the process of at the scrapyard. That had to be bent back in. Now here's the fireman's floor is out, and here all the floors are out. So it's ready for sandblasting. I had a company in Anacortes quote me a price of $800 to come back down and sandblast it on site. But I checked with the rental people and figured that I could do it for dollars. And it turns out I did it for $400. In retrospect, I would have paid them $1,600 to come out and sandblast it. We had 900 pounds of black glass, which is like ground up slag. And we went through that five times. And my what would happen is at the end of every day, we would have to pick up all the sand because if it rained, it would get it all wet. And then my wife would sit out there and sift the sand because I'd get up there or inside the locomotive, all ready to go in the hood, gloves on, and then a piece of paint or something would clog the gun and have to undo everything. So it had to be sifted each time. So, and I'll, there's six gallons of gray primer on it. And I like to point out what I call F unit cancer. To me, it was one, I can say this in retrospect, one of a very foolish divine design feature. Here is the sand filler hatch. Immediately inside the sand hiller hatch is a I beam so that the sand falls into that I-beam in the process of going down into the uh, sand container. And in the bottom of that I-beam, they drilled a quarter inch hole to let water drain out that may get in there. Of course, that wasn't adequate. So sand would accumulate, it would get wet, and rust would spread out in these directions. Any F unit or E unit that's been around for a while, you'll see that uh, rust feature. Here's the back wall cab roof with everything out. We took everything out that ever came out. So now that's primed and ready for painting. And the color is DuPont 503D suede green. It's that typical green color that you see inside as built F unit cabs. So now that's the disadvantage of working outside. It's winter, so we have to wrap everything up till the weather gets better. And here is next spring, time to work again. And all of these little black pen marks are places where there's gonna to have to be Bondo. And one thing to note is this headlight is a steel tube that's cut into the nose. And it has a very sharp dividing line. So that smooth contour that you see on the prototype is Bondo. But of course, in the process of sandblasting, all the Bondo went away. So I had my friendly welder back to put on flag holders, which KCS had, but the BN didn't. So here's the fireman's side with the Bondo done. The other thing was this number, actually the whole front side of this nose had been replaced. When I sandblasted it, this piece of sheet metal had written on it in chalk to be rolled. So they cut the number board off, rolled a new piece of metal, welded it on, and welded this back on with multiple beads of welding, actually pretty ugly. So I did a fillet of Bondo there, uh, which would normally not be true on the prototype. But then on the prototype, that number board is about eight feet in the air. And in my basement, it's right where you can put your hand on it. I built a little teepee outside to sandblast the smaller pieces. So here you can see the headlight fillet in place. And final patching and primer. And I became really well acquainted at Cedra Woolley Auto Parts. 
So now we're masked and ready to paint. And here is the red color on the roof, which for KCS, that's swift red, the red that they use for swift reefers. And with the masking removed, And here's resetting the headlight glazing. Of course, the Nathan P5 air horn had to be rebuilt and sprayed swift red. And then here is armor yellow, which is the same armor that UP uses as the same yellow that we used on armor reefers, hence the name. And then painting the lower red stripe and the lower green section. That, that actually on the blueprints is called KCS green. And it's a very dark black. And I was interested when I visited the uh, British Railway Museum at York, they use the same color and they call it invisible green. Because in most light, it looks black. But if you get the lighting just right, you realize it's a very dark green. And then here is the nose herald in place. I used a slide to project the image on the nose and to trace it onto frisket, which is a kind of a clear masking sheet, and then cut the frisket out with a scalpel and peel it and paint it. So here's reinstalling the roll down windows. I tell people if that looks like the handle from a 51 Chevy, it's because it's the handle from a 51 Chevy. This is GM, folks. And of course, all the miscellaneous parts that had to be cleaned and sprayed to go back in. And so here is the window glazing in place. And that has, each thing has its own story. The F unit is always the, the uh, rubber would deteriorate, the rainwater would run down here and leak inside. And so in order to replace the glass, which was half inch safety glass, I had needed new rubber gaskets. Well, John Ryan was a dentist in Spokane, where I was just working in fact, <laughs> and he bought a E unit to rebuild as a waiting room for his pediatric dental office. And he's retired, but the even is still there on Sprague Street. And he had a open account with EMD so that I could order brand new gaskets for the windshield and or a new brake throttle, a brake handle, independent brake handle. Anyway, I'm glad I had John's advice because he said, Put the rubber gasket in, put the lower edge of the window in, and then work with your fingers. Just work around the edges up and up and up until you get right about here. And you'll decide that there's absolutely no way that that glass is gonna go in that rubber. It says then take a two by four about six feet long and take the butt end of it and whack the window right there in the upper middle. That took a lot of courage, but that was the answer. So now the number boards are back in, the class light lenses are back in, a horn is mounted. So it's starting to look pretty nice. So here is the fireman's side door window panels reinstalled, engineer's side door and new inch and a half plywood floors. They're not fireproof now, but I don't expect to have a uh, engine room fire. And here's the new brown tile flooring. And the fireman's side. And here are Prime is the name of the company that made these wind wings. And here they are rebuilt and reinstalled. And on the engineer's side, there is a rear view mirror. So you can look back and see if you still have your train. And here is the rear wall repainted with all the lettering reinstalled. 
and the uh, perforated metal roofing sheets, perf metal. The company I took those two to be sandblasted said if we use grit, it may distort the metal so it was blasted with cork, which meant I had to sit and watch something on TV and take a toothpick and poke out all the little pieces of cork that got stuck in all the tiny little holes. And here is rebuilding the engineer's dash and rewiring it on the back side. Here's that area that was so filthy, dirty, clean and ready now to put the dash back in. And here it is with all of its gauges. And I learned something fascinating. Uh, oops. Of course, the gauge hand on the ammeter has to be very light to be very responsive. So believe it or not, the shaft that that arrowhead is mounted on is hollow metal. It is the tiniest, thinnest piece of metal tubing I have ever seen in my entire life. Well, it was broken. But that was when I realized it had been broken before. And the way they repair it is with a tiny thread of glass. I don't know if you remember in chemistry lab in high school, melting glass over a Bunsen burner and then pulling it out so you can make a really long, tiny thread of glass. So that's what I did. I got the old piece of glass out, made a new piece, and spliced it together using a glass splice. And there it is in place. Here is the steam generator control panel with new switches, new bulb holders, and uh, I couldn't figure out what to do about this gauge. It was so sadly deteriorated. So I Xerox what was left of the old image onto overhead transparency material, then stripped all the paint off, painted it white, and then used that Xerox transparency to re-letter with a tech pen and to re-put the numbers back on with rub-on lettering and to hand letter the Joseph P. March Corporation in Chicago and to recreate a hand. At the end of the hand is a tiny little M for Joseph Marsh Company. The other thing I discovered was how to restore these panels with the raised lettering that were so severely damaged. First, I tried brush painting around the little raised letters and it looked terrible. It looked like it had been brush painted. What I, what I found out you could do is just spray paint the whole thing black, then use a hobby blade, the kind that's curved like a letter C to scrape off the black paint. So you spray it black then use a knife to scrape the paint off the raised areas. Here's the engineer's side heater control, pneumatic windshield wiper control, and heating fan. Now on passenger units, the heater would be po powered by steam. But on, the, on freight units, they just used hot water. So here is the Chicago pneumatic speed recorder and its drive cable. There's the throttle stand base. The Motorola radio, radio rebuilt. Here's what the brake stand looked like before rebuilding. I don't know how much it weighs, but a lot. Here are the seats, the throttle stand, the independent brake. And that's how far I got before we began to build the addition to our house and the basement that this would end up in. Of course, it was sitting right where we had to dig the hole for the basement. So here, oops. Here we moved it to sit alongside the garage so we could dig this giant hole. And this is the back side of the garage just sort of hanging in the air for now. So then when the basement is built, I had it set in and I had a tube steel frame welded that the locomotive sits on balanced on this central pipe with springs on each side. 
so that eventually my plan was to rock it back and forth. I haven't done that yet. So here it is in the basement, out of the weather, which is very nice. And here is building the Pullman car. And uh, you know, uh, the walls of Pullman cars were three inches thick. So I had to rip two by fours down to two and a half inches so that by the time I added quarter inch plywood on both sides that it would result in a three inch thick wall. So here is the throttle stand in place, the dash lighted. Here is inside the nose. This is the number board lighting box. This is the multiple unit control box. And this is a magnetically operated sander control. This locomotive had auto sand. When you pull auto sand out, whenever the wheel slipped, it, this little valve would automatically apply sand. So things are looking good, except for the one small, really big problem. Here is the seam where the locomotive was cut apart. And I realized if I intended to rock it back and forth or just on general principles, if I just bolted it together and patched the seams, probably those seams would open up. So I either, I had to decide what to do, which was to weld it back together. So down in the basement, I had the welder come and tell him what I needed to do. And he said, well, sparks are going to fly, you know. I said, yeah, how far? He said, well, you see that end wall? So all of the Pullman car, anything vulnerable had to be covered with sheet plywood so it wouldn't be damaged by sparks from the welding. Then after welding it back together, it all had to be sanded and uh, patched and repainted in the basement. So here's a picture of doing that, very messy. And this, my friend Warner, was a backup light from a steam locomotive that looked like it had been stepped on by an elephant. And Warner said, well, that's beyond restoration. And, and you know, he shouldn't have said that. That's always bad for me. So here's the headlight undergoing Bondo treatment. And here's the rim for it. I mean, how many steam locomotive backup lights do you come across? So what I did is I used two by fours and visqueen to build a giant spray booth in the basement. It covered the floor, all four walls and the floor, all four walls and the ceiling and was connected to the exhaust fan that's in the ceiling. So when all, of, when all the visqueen and two by fours came down, here's the F unit finally painted and in the basement and welded back together. And it, in some ways it's nicer than when it came out of the factory. And of course, here is the steam locomotive backup light and NW2 headlight, which is a ordinary bulb, incandescent bulb with a reflector. And here is a SD45 class light and a GP7 twin seal beam headlight. And here is the brake stand finished and back in the locomotive. I no way I could have lifted it in there. I built cut two by fours and I'd rock one side up, put a two by four under it, rock the other side up and gradually lifted it up to where I could get it into the cab. And I tell people this is the ultimate ele elevated cab. The entire railroad is readily visible from inside the cab. And that is that. And now, okay, here's how you get on top of the F unit without a ladder. Of course, all the chains have to be adjusted so it hangs level. Is that, was that really that wide a gap with the tape over it? Oh. 
Here's how you get off the F unit without a ladder. Frankly, it is easier in HL scale. <laughs> it was sitting on cinder blocks, so I've got to move the cinder blocks around to where it's going to land to hold up the inside, which is about as tall as the outside. So I'm always amused when visitors will ask, how did you get it in here? <laughs> and I'll say with a crane, like, I can't think of another way. Nick, I've known you over 50 years, but I promise I never thought you'd get that welded back together. <laughs> yeah. That had to be the biggest challenge of all the there were times there were times when I wondered too in some of the places where there was quite a bit of material missing they just used giant nails you know to fill in as they welded it up oh I wonder what the trick was Yeah, so maybe it wouldn't have been a bad idea not to cut it up, but uh, that by this point it was uh, no longer a was question. Nope. And as Warner well knows, just trying to conceptualize dealing with one of them is a challenge. Just the fact that you got that balanced on center blocks was amazing. <laughs> yeah. I was afraid I still, it would tip. I still have a pile of cinder blocks. Well, you know, once you get the thing in position, I could use a come along hydraulic jack to, you know, fudge things until it was just right. That's right. Mine was a little more than three times that heavy. <laughs> yes, right. units only had one headlight? You mean in general or on the KCS? On the KCS. You know, on the KCS, they all had two headlights except number 20. <laughs> oh, fuck. Oh, thunder. Number 20 was the only KCS E unit to have a single headlight and F unit style number board. So that's how it got to be number 20, which was a 
It was a uh, E7 purchased secondhand from the main central. Okay, here's how it got in the basement. And you can see the uh, red primer colored tube steel frame already in the basement ready to set the pieces down on it. Now this improves my memory. I thought you had rolled it in on pipes. Yeah, no, that's the way I was planning to get it out if it ever comes out. Yeah, we don't like to think that far ahead. Yeah, at least I made a, at least I made provision. You can see the opening in the foundation wall that it would come out through. It wasn't bricked in until the very last. So it's a non-load bearing wall in that section. Oh. Oh. Hey Nick, uh, someone wanted to know if you know how much it weighs. You know, I think all of it together is about 4,000 pounds. And, and at this point, um, how many months or years do you have into the project? About two. can't see well. Was the back wall already in place? Was it yes. in one piece? Yeah, the back wall is setting up. The back wall of the afternoon is leaning against the foundation wall. thing was the base that it sits on was just the right size. <laughs> Although obviously at this point if it wasn't we're in big trouble. Oh, what, what did your neighbors think of all this? Oh we had a crowd, a crowd over to see it happen. In fact the people at work knocked off for lunch to come see it. I was I was wondering if uh the asylum was still open in Cerro Valley at this time. 
<laughs> no, by now it would be being closed and everyone was out on their own. Did you get it in without scratching it? We did, yes. Good. Or breaking any windows. <laughs> See, it just lays together in the middle perfectly. Right? That's amazing. Look at that. <laughs> you knew what you were doing. That is so unbelievable. A gentleman there, John Landers, who repaired our linear accelerator at work, he came over to see it. <laughs> then I tell people that the same uh, crane that set the locomotive in set the beam in the basement. So there is one half of the beam. Ken Rowland's really good with his crane. And that is how it was done. Okay. We got Zoom to work. That was something. Yeah, it's a good job. Anybody have any questions? Nick? Yes. From beginning to end, from the time you bought it until you were satisfied that it was finished, how long? Well, that's a kind of a tough question, but probably about four years, because you realize once it was in the basement, uh, a lot of time went into putting in lighting and wallboard and all that stuff before I finished the F unit. So there was a, sort of a hiatus in there while I did other work. Still, four years is phenomenal. It was hard yeah. to tell watching the pictures. It looked more like a decade or two. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> it, that was 1985. So, well, time passed slower back then. Yeah, it did. <laughs> Thanks for sharing, Nick. It's been great. Sure. Okay. Well, um, thank you very much, Nick. That's uh, 
it's always fascinating. I think this is the third time I've I've watched your this presentation. It's a little different every time. Yeah. Um, it was a fascinating process.